It's a scientific fact that one person in 20 is a psychopath. They're wired a little differently. And most of these psychopaths, you see, they can hide in plain sight, keep a low profile. Some of them get out of control, and so oftentimes they end up in jail or someplace. One person in about a thousand or maybe even more is a pedophile, having an irresistible urge to have sex with young children. And what if you had so much money you did not know what to do with all your money, and you were a pedophile? This could happen. In fact, it does happen quite a lot. You see, there are a thing called the ultra-rich who just have too much money. And if you were so rich that you could buy the law, cover things up, influence police decisions, and buy young children, if you would buy something, then somebody will find a way to sell it to you. So what if you were willing to pay massive dollars for something? What if you're willing to pay massive dollars to have sex with young children? What if you had so much money you could control the news media, divert attention from your crimes, and control what stories are told and what stories get suppressed? What if you had that much money? The evil ultra rich does have this much money. I made the movies greatest sin of the true story of breaking up a pedophile ring that I broke up in Romania and then went to the court trial of Marc Dutro and then we chased that pedophile ring to Dubai. I want to offer you now today a little bit more of the story of Marc Dutro. I said to the police you have to capture him very very soon because he's going to relapse, he's going to do it again. I thought at that moment they are violated and murdered. The police has all the answers. The question remains, why didn't they arrest him? This is from a French news broadcast. Marc Dutroux, monster, pawn of the international pedophile ring, or is he going? Marcinel, a grim suburb of the industrial town of Charleroi in the south of Belgium, where on the 15th of August 1996, the dramatic rescue of two young girls was caught on camera. Letitia Delhaize had been held captive for six days. Sabine Dardenne for more than two months. I remember that around uh, seven or eight o'clock we got these phone calls, these messages that uh, something terrible had happened or something very wonderful had, had happened in Charleroi. Two girls had been released. We discovered there that uh, these children had been locked up in, in, a, in, a, in a very small cage something like this in our beautiful small country Belgium is incredible it was the start of a period of months maybe even years that this was the only story we worked on kidnap rape murder the events of the following months would involve six families and shake a nation to its core it was a tragedy that would gather momentum and spark national outrage over rumors of conspiracy and corruption in the highest levels of the Belgian judicial system. A tragedy that we now know could have been avoided. And at its center, an evil psychopath, Marc Dutroux. <laughs> Grassoloni, a rural suburb of Liège, home of two eight-year-old girls, Julie and Melissa. On June 24th, 1995, a hot summer's day, the two friends went to wave at the traffic from the flyover near their family home. They never returned. 
two girls together disappear at the same moment. You look at England, Holly and Jessica, it came as a shock. Everybody, that this is very unusual. Message à Julie. Julie, ma chérie, je ne t'ai pas dit assez, je t'aime. Distraught and fearing the worst, the parents of the two girls sent out an appeal. Ton papa, ta maman, Maxime et toute la famille. Elisa, ma toute petite fille, mon trésor, si tu pouvais m'entendre, je veux que tu saches que ta maman, ton papa, ton frère, toute la famille, tous nos amis ne font plus qu'une seule chose depuis que tu es parti, te chercher et t'attendre. On pense tous très très fort à toi. Whenever in the United Kingdom young children went missing, there would be a national outcry from the very beginning. And there would have been a very large police investigation mounted. Now, somehow in Belgium, none of that seemed to have taken place. And it just went quiet very quickly. After three weeks, the police were drawing a blank. The parents, desperate to know what had happened to their daughters, hired a local detective who in turn hired a criminal profiler to try to help with the case. The first thing I asked was bring me there where the children had been seen for the last time because I have to see the area. I have to make a geographical mapping in my head. Well, this is Grasse Ologne. That's the area where the children lived. And the most probable scenario is that they came from that road and then walked towards the bridge that crosses the highway, the motorway, where they used to wave at cars. After visiting the location of Julie and Melissa's disappearance, Karine started to put together a profile of the offender. Methodical, unemployed, probably married with children. He took a very high, high risk. This means that he is not a debutant. And with a criminal record for abduction, uh, sequestration and torture, maybe there are five or six people who fit already this small profile. Anyone with a criminal record for a similar crime should have been a prime suspect. Mark de True, imprisoned for the rape and abduction of five women, had been released just three years earlier. Age 38, the true was an unemployed electrician who lived in Charlois with his second wife and two children. He fitted Karine's profile with uncanny accuracy. Karine gave the profile to the police, but despite his previous conviction, the true was never taken in for questioning. The first of a series of police blunders that would define the case. I said to the police, you have to... Uh to capture him very, very soon because he's going to relapse, he's going to do it again. But they just did not listen. Five weeks later, in the opposite end of the country, teenagers Anne Marshall and Effia Lambrex took a holiday with a group of friends in the seaside resort of Blankenberg in the north of Belgium. We had some discussion about it because I didn't want her to go alone without parents. She was 17. And uh, my wife, Betty, she said, let her go. She will be uh, in 18 in, in a few months. And so, yes, uh, they were right. You have to, to let uh, your children go, certainly for a holiday with friends. One night during the holiday, Anne and Effie went to a hypnotist show. A member of the audience filmed the girls on stage. These images would be the last that Paul Marshall would see of his daughter. Later they were caught on security cameras leaving the casino to catch a tram. They never arrived back at their holiday home. One of the friends phoned us on Wednesday evening and he said, um, Anne, and Afia were going to a show in Blankenberge and uh, it was a Tuesday evening but they are not returned. I said you had to go to the police and he said we were 
by police, but they don't believe us, they laugh with us, they say that it's not serious, that uh, Anne is 17 and Evie is 19, and that they will be somewhere with friends, boyfriends or something like that, that they are doing a, a sort of adventure. I said, no, it's not possible. And uh, we were very worried, and at that moment uh, I thought, uh, they are murdered, uh, they are, I thought at that moment they are violated and murdered. Like the parents of Julie and Melissa, the Marshalls felt let down by the police investigation. Frustrated, they started their own poster campaign to look for the girls, searching over Europe and across the world. But despite the search efforts, no trace of Anne and Effie were found, and no connection was made between their disappearance and that of Julie and Melissa nor that there may be a serial kidnapper on the loose. It would be obvious to anyone they'd been abducted. I mean, it could not be that these girls had just got lost uh, and strolled off and, and died somewhere, especially when invariably they went in pairs. It just looked as though that someone was very active. Nobody in Belgium inside the police force was so intelligent to think that if two girls are kidnapped in June and two others are kidnapped in August, it might be the same criminal. It's, that's, already that seemed to be too complicated for them. August 1995, Belgium. In the past two months, four girls had vanished from opposite ends of the country. The local police departments investigating the disappearances of Anne and Effie and Julie and Melissa were getting nowhere. They had even failed to make a connection between the cases that would point towards a serial kidnapper. But 100 miles away in Cholois, another department within the police force, the National Gendarmerie, had received some disturbing information pointing them to a prime suspect. Three weeks after Anne and Effie's disappearance, a letter had arrived from a woman saying that she had seen two teenage girls being held in her son's house. The letter was signed Janine Lawrence, the mother of Mark Dutroux. She wrote a letter to the police to say that she knew that two girls are kept by Dutroux in house. Two girls of 16 and 18, she said. Anne was 17, Evie 19. Police didn't do anything about it. Division in the Belgian police force, into local police and national gendarmerie, bred a mutual distrust and dislike between the two departments. In fact, for the last two years, the gendarmes in Cholwa had been collating a confidential file with other evidence pointing to Mark Dutroux as a suspect. But they made no effort to share this information or the contents of Janine Lauren's letter with the local police who were investigating the disappearance of the missing girls. Everybody knew that they were in some kind of uh, competition. And if you have a competition in sports, that means one team wants to make a goal and the other wants to make a goal too. What we see here is that there is a competition between two police forces. One of it is uh, the gendarmerie. In 1993, the Chalois gendarmerie had been contacted by one of Marc Dutroux's tenants, Claude Thiron, who said he had some disturbing information about his landlord. I first met him in 1992. We were in the car. There were two girls walking along. I think they'd been drinking. One of them was staggering. And he parked the car at the side of the road and then he suggested kidnapping the two girls. You had to creep up behind them, put your hand over their mouth and put them into the car, close the door, the child lock was on so they couldn't get out, and if need be, knock them out. But I refused point blank. I said to Mark Dutroux, you're mad, I'm not doing that. He took me straight home, and I went straight to the gendarmerie within the hour. The gendarmes persuaded Thiroux to become their informant. Over the next two years, he reported that Dutroux was planning to kidnap girls to sell them into a prostitute network. When he was out in his car or van or whatever, 
When he saw any little girls, he used to say, oh, they're young and fresh, that would sell well. But the police knew this, they knew everything. Three other informants also came forward confirming Tiro's testimony. But remarkably, in the summer of 1995, when young girls started to vanish, the gendarmes didn't take to true in for questioning, a decision that would have tragic consequences. This decision was obviously influenced by the ultra rich. Born in Ixel in 1956, the true grew up in Obey, a small village near Charlois in Belgium. The oldest son of Janine and Victor de True, who had a reputation for harsh treatment of their five children. There have been interventions of the local police several times in that, that house, in that family. There are neighbors who already at that moment, in the, uh, the moment itself, uh, had their testimonies about this kid being beaten and beaten all the time. At the age of just five, the true was forced to take a one-hour walk and then a train journey to school every day on his own. He's raised as a, with only negative feelings, no emotion. In fact, the only message he gets from his parents is, we never wanted you, uh, go to hell. That's, you, you're worthless. That, that's the idea in which he his life as a teenager. What might be more interesting to me is that the first real affection Marc Dutroux has experienced is when, at the age of 15, he goes to school in Charleroi and he meets uh, an old pedophile there. And this is the first... He denies it because Dutroux is a, a macho after all, but it's absolutely clear that at the age of 14, 15, Marc Dutroux is a boy prostitute. That's the, these are the visions in which he, he gets an adult. Uh, sex is commercial. As a young adult, Dutroux would hang out at the local ice skating rinks, where he found he had easy access to young girls. The manager of the Chalois ice rink received complaints that Dutroux was tripping them up so he could touch them. It was here that he met his wife. Michel Martin. In 1985, three years after they met, Dutroux and Martin were arrested by police. Dutroux was found guilty of the abduction and rape of five women. Michel Martin was also sent to prison for her role in the crimes. Michel Martin is always presented as a weak woman, totally under influence of the monster Marc Dutroux. If you look into the, look to the facts of 1985, as the first series of, of kidnappings, you can see that uh, Michel Martin, at at least two occasions, drives the car while the true uh, grabs a girl in, in the street. It's she who goes to the shop to to rent the, the camera to produce pedophile material while the true is, is raping the girl. The true was released from prison in 1992 after serving just six years of his 13-year sentence. Immediately, he started on an elaborate plan that would enable him to continue kidnapping young girls, but this time without being caught. He began constructing an underground cell in the basement of one of his houses, in Marchienne d'Ocherie. Informant Claude Thirault tipped off the gendarmes. When they visited Dutroux and questioned him, he told them that he was simply renovating his basement. The true abandoned Marchienne d'Ocheri and began to build another cell, this time beneath his main home in Marcinelle. By the summer of 1995, when Julie and Melissa went missing from Liège, the true cell was complete. A few weeks after the, kid, the disappearing of uh, Julie and Melissa, they know everything about Marc Dutroux, everything they need to know. They know about his trial in 1989. They have four people who have informed the police uh, spontaneously to say that Marc Dutroux asked them to help kidnap girls. They know he's, 
he has this stupid idea about cages putting uh, kids in there. If you need to know where Julia and Melissa are, the police has all the answers. They have the whole file. The question remains, why didn't they arrest him? Instead of arresting Dutroux, the gendarmes started a secret surveillance operation on his house in Marcinelle, codenamed Othello. In charge was gendarme René Michaud. René Michaud was the man, the man in charge. He monopolized all the information that came in about Dutroux in uh, the second half of 1995. It's all going to René Michaud. And he puts it in his back and he says, this is my secret operation. I keep my information here. Under Operation Othello, the gendarmes watched the house for five months, but for some reason made no further moves on Dutroux. Then, on December the 6th, he was arrested by the local police for car theft and placed in custody. The gendarmes, hearing that the police were planning to search the house, became alarmed. La gendarmerie, Monsieur Michaud. The gendarme, Monsieur Michaud, hurried to the examining magistrate stepped into the room and said, don't send an ordinary police commissioner, send me, Michaud, because I know Dutroux and I've had him under surveillance for some time. So, they didn't send a police commissioner, they sent Michaud. René Michaud and a team of gendarmes searched the house. They discovered a stash of video cassettes. Michaud later watches them and determines that two of the cassettes are of no use to their investigation. But René Michaud put some kind of symbol on it and it meant don't, not important, don't look at it. These were the two most crucial cassettes. Four years later, the two videos would be discovered and watched by another police department. One of them showed Mark Dutroux constructing a ventilation system to his underground cell. The other one showed Dutroux raping a girl on a trip to Slovakia and other images of a group of young gypsy children undressed below the waist. Michaud had also missed a third cassette, a recording of the parents' appeal on Julie and Melissa's disappearance. Michaud and a locksmith then went into the cellar that connected to the hidden cell. He went downstairs into the cellar, alone, with the locksmith who had opened the door, where the gendarmerie suspected Julie and Melissa were in a hidden cell, because Dutroux was a man who abducts girls and has a reputation for having a hiding place in his cellar. Well, he went down alone with the locksmith into the cellar. In the cellar, they discovered chains, vaginal cream, a gynecological speculum. René Michaud is supposed to be looking for a hidden cage. He, he hears the whisper of voices of children. Uh, there's a guy um, next to him who's, who's helping him. He, he hears these voices too, and they say, it's strange, we have... We have children's voices here. The reaction of René Michaud, he says, he shouts, silence. And of course, there's no whispering anymore. And uh, they leave. On interroge, the locksmith was questioned. And the locksmith said, I heard the voices so well that I said to Michaud, I'm not leaving here before we've stripped the place. Those voices are in the house. And Michaud responded on the 13th of December in the cellar, who's the gendarmerie officer here, you or me? Then I went home, I told my wife, and I kept my mouth shut. Operation Othello was called off. Michaud reported to his superiors that they had found nothing and that Dutroux was free from suspicion. The question is, is this all go back to competition between two police forces? We have one player in the team who is standing before an empty goal, having 20 occasions to put the ball in, in the goal. But for some strange reasons, he always hits left, right, over, but he never does what a, a normal policeman should have done. 
René Michaud would later say that he believed the children's voices had been coming from the street outside. In fact, they belonged to Julie and Melissa. March 1996. Mark Dutroux is freed from prison, having served four months for car theft. He is also free from suspicion of the kidnap of four girls the previous summer, as the gendarmerie have called off their secret surveillance of his house in Marcinelle, Operation Othello. Dutroux is in prison. Dutroux in prison must have been saying to himself, the gendarmerie, they really are good, because he knew through his wife that the house had been searched, and he knew through his wife that Michaud had gone into the cellar, and he knew through his wife that Michaud had come back up without having seen anything. On the 9th of August, the true and an associate, heroin addict Michel Lalieve, drove 80 miles to the town of Betri. In search of young girls, they hung around the local swimming pool. 14-year-old Leticia Delhez appeared. She didn't return home. But the true's luck was about to run out. When Leticia um, disappears, it happens in Le Chateau, a very small district where we, we, you had a terrific uh, judge, a uh, juge d'instruction, Jean-Marc Conrot. You have a, a public attorney, Michel Bourlet, who was very touched emotionally about what he saw on television about these parents. This is a guy who, who believes in law and b believes in the system. When the phone call comes, uh, a girl has disappeared. This is like a war situation in Le Chateau. Our goal is to move quickly, to gather as much evidence as possible so we can find the person alive. Because it's only when our investigation is well underway that we can know whether it's a kidnapping, a disappearance, an abduction. Within three days, the investigators had found a witness who had seen a suspicious white van in the area and another who could recall part of its number plate. It was a routine for the police to, to put this combination of the computer, they see Marc Dutroux convicted for kidnapping five girls in 1989. That's how they find, they have found uh, Marc Dutroux. Dutroux was arrested for the kidnap of Leticia. Also arrested were Michel Martin and Michel Lalieve. But it would be another three days of interrogation before the police knew what they were dealing with. The true and Liliev were being held and questioned, and Liliev was in need of a fix, and Liliev at some point cracked, and it all came out. The interrogators confronted the true with Liliev's confession that they knew now where Letitia was. But the true delivered an even bigger surprise. He confessed that two months earlier, in the small town of Cain, near Tournai, he had kidnapped another girl, 12-year-old Sabine Dardenne. He and Villiers had driven her back to the house in Marcinelle, where she was smuggled inside in a trunk and then held captive in the underground cell. During the interrogation, well, Mark Dutroux said, it's not one girl I'm going to give you, but two. And he pointed to a photo behind me, and it was Sabine's photo. And I turned around and I said to him, that's Sabine. And he said to me, yes. They, they didn't know about Sabine there then. They didn't, they didn't know anything about it. This was a complete surprise to find a second girl. The police took the troop back to the house in Marcinelle. 
They needed him to show them the hiding place where they would find Letitia and Sabine. We were faced with something unbelievable. It's the first time I can remember discovering anything like that. So, for a police officer, freeing two girls is something... There are no words to describe it. It's indescribable. The nation rejoiced as Sabine and Letitia were returned home. But within days, the horror of what they had had to suffer began to surface. Details of the basement cell where they'd been held prisoner were revealed to the outside world. I've been into that cage. Uh, if you see a picture of it, of it, if you're going to show pictures of that cage on television or in a newspaper, it can never, never describe what it's really like. It's, it's like this. You can't, if you try to spread your arms, you can't get any further than this. Uh, you can't stand there. It, 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 it comes uh, only till here. This, you wouldn't even, you wouldn't even put a dog in a, a space like that. The cell had been meticulously hand-built by Dutroux. Michel Martin had painted it yellow. The girls were kept there, often with no water, no electricity, and fed on cold tin food and moldy bread. Once released, they were taken upstairs and chained to the bed so they wouldn't escape. There, they were subjected to frequent rapes. The true referred to 12-year-old Sabine as his new wife. He had brainwashed his young victims, telling them that he was the nicest member of the gang, who was protecting them from the more evil members who would kill them if they escaped. So what happens when the police finally opens that, that cage, Sabine and Letizia come out, but the first man who's there in front of them is Marc Dutroux. He's proud to, to show the police his construction, how good it was, was hidden. And he's very proud when uh, he sees that Sabine, neither Letizia, dare to come out. They're still there in the corner. They're uh, afraid. They think that the evil guys are there. And Dutroux has to talk to them and say, no, no, come out, it's okay. And they, and they both kiss him and say thank you. J'ai eu l'immense plaisir de vous annoncer que nous avons retrouvé une scène et sauve de Lucia de Lucie Sabine. The release of Sabine and Letitia had extra resonance for the parents of Anne, Effia, Julie and Melissa. For me, it was a proof that I was right by saying all that year that it was possible that we could find Anne and Aphia alive. I always looked for living persons, and I'm happy that I looked for living persons, but because it's a different when you look for def living persons, you really look, you don't waste a second 
And I am pleased that I did it because now I can say I did everything to look for them. Files of other missing children around the country flooded into Neuf Chateau. Bourlet and Connerot and their team worked continuously, searching other properties connected with the true. They still had that hope maybe we find another cage with living girls somewhere. But it soon became clear that the search efforts had come too late. On August the 17th, two days after the release of Sabine and Letitia, the bodies of Julie and Melissa were discovered, buried in Dutroux's garden at Sala Boussier. I mean, for us investigators, emotionally, we went through the various stages in reverse. We started, I'd say, with something that was joyful, the discovery of Sabine and Letitia. And then we moved toward the discovery of things that were extremely sad. Other children, including Anne and Effie, were still missing. The Belgian police requested the help of the British police team that had been involved in the case of Fred and Rosemary West to help in the search. It was just like being back at Cromwell Street. The media were there in their hordes. Uh, they were camped out everywhere. And they would not go away. John Bennett and the Belgian police were to search each of the two six houses in the area, looking for missing children. The search moved to a house in Jume, where neighbors had informed police that Dutroux had been using digging equipment in the garden. Dutroux was very capable of disguising what he had done. He had gone to a lot of trouble uh, to bury and hide his victims. Anyone who considers using a JCB or an earth moving truck to put somebody something like 15 foot below the ground just shows them to be what they are, controlling psychopaths who are extremely devious. A week after the arrival of Bennett's team, they uncovered the bodies of two girls. Anne and Evia had been drugged and buried alive. Alleszins één vraag voor ons is opgelost. Dat is dat wij wij niet meer hoeven te zoeken dat ze gevonden zijn. The nation grieved for the families. Their search had come to an end, but the shockwaves of the case had only just started. Grief turned to anger as details of the bungled investigation came out. Neuf Chateau, Palais de Justice. Here in 1996, Marc de True was charged with the kidnap, rape and murder of four young girls and the kidnap and rape of two others. While the nation recoiled in horror, rumors spoke of conspiracy and corruption, reaching to the highest levels of government, as details of the bungled police investigation began to surface. This was in the period that the public opinion discovered Operation Otello, discovered all the things that had, had gone wrong before the arrest of the truth. So their reaction is, there must be some conspiracy, there must be something. This is unbelievable. The Neuf Chateau authorities instigated a broad and vigorous investigation into a suspected paedophile network, arresting 29 people, including police, gendarmes, and prominent businessmen. But it appeared to some that they had dug too deep. Connerot, the investigating magistrate, was sacked from the case under a tenuous accusation that he had lost his objectivity, compounding rumors of an establishment cover-up. The situation in Belgium was like a, 
a revolution. Belgians took to the streets in protest. Workmen went on strike and firemen turned their hoses on official buildings. The protest culminated in the biggest demonstration since the Nuremberg rallies, the White March. White to represent the innocence of the children. I think it was the biggest manifestation ever. There were no posters in, in the streets to say you go to Brussels that day for the White March. It was a word that was spread amongst Belgians. There wasn't even much publicity on, on radio and television. Everybody knew that they had to be there. There were more than 300,000 people marching to the streets of Brussels. Someone wrote a letter and put it on the grave of Anne the day after the White March. And he wrote and he said, Anne, it was a good day yesterday. And we saw your father for, for the first time again laughing. And that's the truth. It was that feeling. The people had united in their thousands against the Belgium they felt was rotten to the core. The protests were too great to be ignored. In an attempt to appease them, a parliamentary committee was set up to examine the police investigation and the secretive Operation Othello. It concluded that the structure of the police system needed to be reformed. While they had found no evidence of corruption, the true had profited from their incompetence. To me, the, the crucial sentence in the final report of the, the Parliamentary Commission was there are so many errors, so many mistakes during this investigation that it can't be explained only by a uh, mistake. There must be more. The court case finally got underway in 2004, eight years after the truce capture, in the new Palais de Justice at Arlon. 500 witnesses were called to testify. De Trou, the most hated man in Belgium, along with Michel Martin and Michel Lelièvre, was present in court, protected behind bulletproof glass. The victims, Sabine and Letitia, were also present to testify against them. I can assure you that all of these people have frightening personalities. Letitia was afraid of the way they looked at her. She was afraid of their mocking attitudes. They often taunted us in a sadistic way, by looking the victims in the eye, by looking at us, by threatening us. For four months, the court was drip-fed with the horror of what had happened to the girls and the confusion of the case. De True maintained that he was merely part of a bigger paedophile network and denied the kidnap and murder of Julie and Melissa. As the basement cell had been the centre of the tragedy, it also became the focus of the case. The court heard that Julie and Melissa had been alive in the cell at the time that René Michaud had searched the house. With the true in custody for car theft, they had been left for four months with no electricity or heating. Michelle Martin, visiting the house to feed her dogs, claimed that she'd been too afraid to go into the cell, so she pushed bags of food through the cell door. Julie and Melissa, unable to reach it, had starved to death. We had to go see the dungeon. So, we all went to see the dungeon. It's absurd to understand how human beings could live in there. It's despicable. The feeling I had and the image I have of this dungeon, it's... I think one of the most moving moments was when I saw one of the parents, Julie's father, Jean-Denis Lejeune, and Letitia, arm in arm in this dungeon, crying because they had seen a little inscription that one of the young victims had made, using her nails. She still had something to say before she died. And to see the looks on their faces, Jean-Denis Lejeune and Letitia, in that dungeon, 
it's clear that all you could do was cry. After four months, Dutroux was found guilty of the kidnap and rape of the six girls and the murder of Anne and Effia. He received life imprisonment. Michel Martin received 30 years and Aliev 25 years. But the trial had raised more questions than it had answered. 30 witnesses had died in mysterious circumstances in the run-up to the trial. DNA tests and hair samples had gone missing or hadn't been performed. Operation Othello, conspiracy theories and paedophile networks had been swept aside in order to stick fast to the theory that the true was an isolated predator. The biggest tragedy is that um, when the true was arrested and we found out how much went wrong in the past, we had all these politicians uh, saying we're going to improve things, this never can happen again. And we ended with a trial with 50% uh, of the questions unanswered. I can make just a remark that, that these questions are unanswered, but if I would be one of these parents, I don't know how to continue my life. 2005 marked the 10th anniversary of the girl's disappearance. And Belgium has not forgotten. I'm not afraid that, uh, that we will forget uh, Dutroux. I don't think so. I, I am afraid that they forget that Dutroux was not alone. I, I am afraid that uh, people will forget that there was also Martin. Martin was a teacher. But she didn't give uh, little children uh, something to eat, to survive. No, she didn't. I don't think, I'm sure that no one will forget Dutroux. But I'm frightened that they will forget that it's more than Dutroux. That there were more persons, that there is Michel Elieff, that there is Martha and perhaps others. Perhaps others. Children go missing every day throughout the world. It happens. Most of these are related to people who are relatives, but some of them are completely unexplained. And there is an ultra-rich group of people who are willing to pay money because they have so much money. You see, I made a movie about the, and I made a trilogy actually of The Greatest Sin, one, two, and three, to tell the story and to give you, the people, proof of this international gang. It's not about who, but it's about breaking this up from the intellectual level. You see, there's a story that I made in making this trilogy. And no one in the press or media will still allow any of this to be covered. But they won't allow these stories to be told. No one in the press or media will allow these movies to be seen. They're covered up. You see, they tried to suppress all of my work, all the work that I've done. And it's my duty and my obligation to tell the story. So read the books, watch the movies, share and care, and decide for yourself. If you are not outraged by this, you are not human, at least in my opinion. I think that we need to all be touched by this and to do something to share and to care. We need to have some outrage. I am outraged. That's why I became outrageous. And you, the people, just think in your heart. You see, because evil succeeds when good people do nothing. Silence in the face of evil is in itself evil. You can make a difference. You need to voice out and talk. And the world is a dangerous place because of those who do nothing when they look at evil. Do something before the ultra-rich enslave us all.